at Lokwa and Sharon will do most of the speaking this morning before handing on to Patrick Guillemard. Patrick is our Associate Director of our Health and Safety team based here in Jersey. Patrick will be talking about access audits and how they can assist your business with meeting the requirements of this legislation. Next up will be Martin Buckland. Martin is the Managing Director of HR at Work, based in the UK. So Martin will be giving us a brief overview of the lessons learned in the UK. We're also delighted to be joined by Ant Lewis, Ant is a campaigner for people with disabilities in Jersey. And Ant will be telling us his story of how his life changed following a stroke back in 2007. We're also joined by Angela, Angela Goddard. Angela works for the Health Department and has kindly agreed to facilitate our British Sign Language today. So thank you to everyone who's given up the time this morning um, to tell us about this important piece of legislation. As I said, there will be time for questions after the presentations. We're all here to learn, so please don't be shy. Put your hand up. And uh, no question is a silly question. That five-year point is a good place to start because this law should have been in within four years. And actually the last component that we're looking at today, disability, um, took two years to formulate. So that just gives you a little bit of a taster, a harbinger of just a little bit uh, how much more complex uh, this last piece of the jigsaw is compared to um, the ones that went before it. But bear with us. Uh, we thought we'd start by giving you fundamental uh, need-to-know points um, in the law, your obligations as business owners, um, HR practitioners, lawyers in the room, I see. So uh, these are the fundamental need-to-know points. And this will also hopefully give you the key to uh, the other presentations following me. Um, Independence Day uh, today, for the Americans rather than the English. Um, however, I want to start, uh, I've seen quite a few presentations, quite a lot of information going on around the island, there's been a lot of oversimplification, so I am going to try and you know, demystify a few things and, uh, and, and with respect to fellow practitioners correct a few misconceptions out there. Um, there is this fundamental starting point which is wrong, which is, oh, this is all about letting people with wheelchairs into my offices, isn't it? Uh, I think it's all very simplistic. No, no, it is so much more than that. That is really just the tip. That's just, that is, it is about that, but that's only one aspect of uh, what's to follow. Quality of life and to reduce the inequality uh, between disabled and non-disabled islanders. That's from the Chief Minister's statement in May 2017. That's the fancy name of the regulations which get inserted into our discrimination law. It happens in two months' time. And just to reassure you, it is the same legislative approach as before. You know, the protection's the same, the perpetrators haven't altered, the victims are the same, uh, liabilities created in the same way, eight weeks to bring a claim, £10,000 for each head of claim, there are some exemptions, um, they've been supplemented, but the, the basic ones are still there and there are a few defences. Um, however, it's new, there are elements which are new. There's a radical model, which uh, I'll take you through in a second, we're not the medical model, we've gone for a social model, and we have two new heads of discrimination, i.e. two more ways in which discrimination can happen, uh, which I will also take you through. And whilst I've just said to you the financial and personal liability risks have altered, um, budget concerns have altered with this one, uh, because, okay, having said in the UK it's £187 to make most reasonable adjustments, it won't always be that case. And I also think there's budgetary considerations in, in that kind of other way of opportunity costs. You're going to have to um, actively spend thinking time on solving some of these issues and removing some of these barriers. Okay? So that's another form of investment of your uh, busy time. So, um, social model. What do we mean when we talk about social model? Well, apologies if you've seen this before. It's used, uh, you know, it's used everywhere, some people hate it, but I, if you've never seen it before, it's a fantastic way of just telling you in one visual what the social model is all about. So if you start at the left, we talk, perhaps wrongly, about equal opportunities. Equal opportunities is predicated on the fact that we're all treated equally. 
Um, and of course, treating people equally doesn't actually help everybody, as demonstrated in the first graphic. So we come along with our anti-discrimination law and we try to treat people equitably. So we put support systems in, or uh, statutory obligations, which will allow those who are disadvantaged to uh, have the same equitable treatment as those who are not disadvantaged. But the social model completely reverses that out. It says stop trying to put sticking plasters over um, a situation. You need to remove the systemic barrier. And that's what states of Jersey have gone for. They've gone for the UN Convention de definition of disability, and they've gone for a social model. So hopefully, you, this, keep this in your mind as we, as we get through some of the uh, trickier issues to follow today. Um, it's just about removing those barriers. Think of it as outside in rather than um, how you can protect yourself and avoid liability. Quite different from, and I have to say, social model doesn't um, apply to the other protected characteristics. They, they haven't altered in any way. Although, you'll try to be can do. I should say, I, I did try to find a um, football, I should really use a football backdrop here, shouldn't I? But um, uh, not everyone's into football, a bit of a cricket girl myself, so you got cricket on that one. Right, disability is. It's got four components. Okay, so a person who has got one or more long term, that's the first criteria, and by long term the law says six months or more, and I should actually say it's expected to last six months or more, um, or has lasted six months, um, or is for life, i.e., as you say in law school, until death. Um, that's what long term means. Um, secondly, Rather than just physical and mental, like the UK, a bit wider, uh, you are also disabled if you meet the criteria if you have a physical, which some very clever judge went all the way up to the Court of Appeal to explain that meant something wrong with them physically. So he deserves his pension. Uh, if you have a physical, a mental, uh, intellectual, or sensory, think of the five senses, impairment. Okay, and you could have one or more of those. That's wider than other countries and other jurisdictions have. Although, to be fair, those jurisdictions do include, say, intellectual as part of a subset of mental. And sensory, in some ways, is a subset of physical. But we've got that broad definition. And then thirdly, and this is really quite radical, and we're not talking about does it actually affect them? You know, if you're sitting here from the UK, thinking, well, oh, I have to prove a significant long-term effect. No, no, no. In Jersey, we're just looking for, hypothetically, could it affect them? That's how wide our definition is. Lots of consultation on this. Um, so if that impairment could adversely affect a person's ability to participate in any activity, any activity, not normal day-to-day -day activities like the UK, then that satisfies the third criteria uh, of what a disability is. Um, and then there's a fourth criteria. It'll be interesting to see how this plays out. Because uh, we're not, uh, the politicians adopted the UN Convention definition of disability, which is the first three criteria, but we've always put our own spin on these things, and we shoved on this fourth criteria, which is in respect of an unlawful act. Um, hopefully some of you will, just to recap, will remember, unlawful acts for an employer are basically the employee life cycle, recruiting, terms and conditions, dismissing any other detriment. And for those of you providing goods and services, it's um, refusing people access to your goods and services, the terms and conditions of those goods and services, and the manner in which you provide those services. Those are the unlawful acts. So what this is saying is, if you as an individual have a long-term impairment, which could hypothetically affect your ability, whether or not it does, and your employer comes along, or the goods and services provider comes along and commits an unlawful act, then, and only then, are you disabled. So I hope you can see that distinction. Because what I'm, what I'm finding on the island is people are very casually, lay people, casually throwing around, um, oh, have they got a disability? Well, that's not the question. The question has to be, have they got an impairment? How long have they had it? Okay, could it affect their work? Could it affect their ability to access my goods and services? Uh, right, how can we help? That's the conversation that needs to happen. So if you take away one thing from this morning, Please try and correct your usage of the word disability. Try to think of impairments, think of these four criteria, and I'm going to come to it in a minute. You need to get in between the third and the fourth if you wish to avoid liability. So, um, I'm just telling you on this slide 
there are some, actually, let's just do a quick straw poll. This is what I wanted to prove to you that 14% is wrong. Um, can you all put your hand up to start with, please? All of you, just stick your hand up. Um, keep it up. If you have, and I don't wish you to disclose anything, a physical, mental, intellectual, or sensory impairment. I'm keeping mine up because I can't see, I've got eyesight problems, and it's born with asthma, so I'm keeping mine up. Right, okay. Keep, keep it up, don't worry, I'll ask you to disclose it. Right, take your hand down if it's not long term. So I've had those for six months, and it works better to last longer, right? So, okay, now the rest of you, no one here can take their hand out of the next bit. This is um, almost, if you like, the superfluousness of this third criteria. Whatever you've got can affect your, your ability to participate in any activity. It can do. It just has to be hypothetical. So stopping right there and looking around the room, this is the number of people who are disabled in this room. And if I was to do a quick straw poll, that roughly looks to me about 20-25%. But if anyone got a different view on that, so I think it's a lot more than the 14% which is being bandied around. Thank you. For that down. Um, disabled unless an act has occurred. And so therefore, the second key message for you um, as business owners here is you've got to get in between, so going back a page, that third and that fourth criteria. Somebody could have an impairment that would affect their ability, but if you don't base any decisions or don't uh, make any decisions at all based on that, unless you can justify it. Okay, we'll come to the defences. So if you can get in between that third and the fourth criteria, that's when you will be avoiding liability. Okay, I'm not going to dwell on this uh, uh, slide. I shall leave it for people because the bottom line is, um, as stated there, it's simpler in Jersey to prove a much wider scope uh, to show who is going to be going to be disabled as say opposed to the UK, which has this medical model, which is complicated to prove and limited scope. I'll leave you to enjoy the, uh, the bits where it's not wider and, and narrower, as uh, people have asked me that. So, excuse me, at law we're, we're very practical. Um, can you please, when you're, uh, you know, this starts in two months time, you need to be practical. Assume anyone who is not well, or is behaving oddly, or asking for help, may be covered by the law, if you commit an unlawful act. And please don't waste time on legal questions. Okay, I mean, if you're getting sued and you're coming to me and we're going to tribunal, I'll, I'll be wasting time. I'll be, we're not wasting time. Are we doing all the legal nuances on that side? At your stage, at the coal face, don't waste time on the legal questions. Uh, concentrate on the consequences of the impairment. Does it affect that person's ability to work or to enjoy your customers or clients, to enjoy your goods and services? How long will it last? How can we help? That needs to be your mindset with this last piece of the jigsaw. <coughs> okay, so halfway there, hold on, over the hill. So that's disability. Um, how, how do, so what? So what does it mean? What's the trigger? How does discrimination happen? Well, once uh, disability is established, or those three criteria are met, then six statutory duties are triggered. Now, historically, the last three years, only four, we've only had four, but two new ones, which I'll take you through. Um, now, I don't need you to be you know, discrimination experts on this. Don't worry if you don't get uh, all the various tests here. I'm just giving you, uh, this is just illustration to show you just how wide this is and how it plays out in practice. And all these examples are real. Um, I haven't had to make any of them up. So, um, you're used to our, our old friend, direct discrimination, a rule. You can't apply a rule which disadvantages a disabled person unless you can justify it. Okay? Now, I'm going to apologise here about my example, it's a bit mean. Um, I'm just going to give you a simple example first and then take you to why I use this example. So, uh, Laura at work, this weekend we had a, it's a knockout um, and several of my team entered that event. Imagine, if I, if I was as directly concerned about, as I am now, two of the mill, uh, injured themselves afterwards. Um, if I had said, I would like to have a medical certificate from each of you who wish to participate um, before you can take part in this uh, fun day. And I've got, imagine, um, another severely depressed member of staff who cannot provide that certificate. That would be an example of indirect disability discrimination. My rule is a requirement for the certificate. It disadvantages a person with a mental impairment, in my example, depression. And can I justify that? No. The quick answer is, you can't. Just because people have depression doesn't mean they can't go on fun days. In fact, they can certainly do certain tasks, but not other tasks. 
too oversimplified to justify that. Um, so that's, that's an easy example for you. The reason I put this example in is, I was trying to cheer you up by showing you something that could be justified, but actually it's a very tough example. Uh, but it is a true example, this is a Tesco's case. Um, and sometimes a co course of conduct is both indirect discrimination and also the previous example, disability-related discrimination. And one of the things in this case was, is it, which one is it? And the judge said, it doesn't really matter, it's both. He personally thought it were better to disability-related, but they heard it under indirect. And let me just unpack this for you. In Tesco's, Matty, Mr. Matty, um, was a fitter in their distribution centre, which was a, the low temperature centre. It's a freezer centre where they kept their um, provisions and their perishables. And he was diabetic, and basically he was sacked because, without worrying about um, the ins and outs of diabetes, if you work in too low temperature, uh, it can cause you to have, um, have an epileptic fit. Um, so they decided they couldn't change their machinery. You can't increase the temperature. We need to keep the food at a certain temperature. So I'm afraid, Mr. Matty, you can't work here. He was sacked. And the court said, fine, that's it. That's justification. That was an example of um, indirect disability discrimination going all the way through. Now, it's not an obvious rule, is it? Now, here, it's not like asking for my medical certificate, but here, there's this kind of implied rule that Mr. Matty has to work in a cool environment. And you will have all sorts of little implied rules where your employees have to work in a certain setup, a certain environment. That's the kind of breadth of this PCP. So I'm sorry if that's a bit mean, but I think it, it, it shows to show you just how wide the rule can be. Right, now this one is the one that everyone's talking about. If not, not the other five, they're just concentrating on reasonable adjustments. And yeah, quite rightly so, it is important and it is new. And it is the creative part of the law. So if you like being a uh, solver, problem solver, this one's for you. Um, there are three new, so even though it's one new duty, it has three elements. So really we've got eight duties. Um, there are three new duties to make reasonable adjustments. To avoid, this is the test, substantial disadvantage caused by one, a provision criteria or practice. Okay, so if you have an arrangement, some kind of rule, um, and that disadvantages somebody, you're going to have to think, how do I make a reasonable adjustment so that they're not disadvantaged? Two, and this is uh, what Paddy's going to speak to you about, you uh, are going to have to think about making a reasonable adjustment to the physical features of your premises if they disadvantage, substantially disadvantage a disabled person. And the good news is that doesn't come in for two years. I did lobby for five years to try and give you a chance to get your ducks in a row because if you want, you know, you've got to interact with landlords here and get building permissions and all sorts of uh, planning consents. Um, but you've got two years to audit your premises and think, do we need to alter the physical feature? And again, without worrying about the law, it's defined widely that the physical features extends to land and approaches to your buildings as well as the actual nitty gritty of the inside of your buildings. Um, and thirdly, the last uh, duty is you have to try to avoid substantial disadvantages caused by the absence of an auxiliary aid or service. Um, so, uh, if you can make things easier by providing various auxiliary aids or service, and that could actually be another person to work with the person, uh, it's as wide as that, um, then that could be deemed to be a reasonable adjustment. So, to give you an example, this morning, when we were arranging a breakfast briefing, we uh, had to think about making reasonable adjustments to make sure that people with disabilities could enjoy this offering as well as the able-bodied people. So, um, when we were arranging this, we had to think about uh, induction loops, uh, places to eat at tables, uh, checking uh, whether or not attendees needed sign language, and checking whether or not you needed the information in different formats. Um, and I'm sure Ant won't mind me saying, Ant's presenting for you. We had to make sure that um, everything from getting onto the stage to the form of presentation that he was given, the format, the media, was such that um, he too was able to participate in giving presentation in the same way um, as any of the other presenters. Okay? So, um, what else to say about reasonable adjustments? I'm mindful Paddy's doing it, but the justification side, or if doesn't exist, that's, that's to do with indirect. But in my opinion, I think um, the justification for uh, defending either disability-related or indirect discrimination and reasonable adjustments are all going to be one and the same thing, because I can't see a case where if you could have made a reasonable adjustment, it would be 
uh, justify to indirectly discriminate. I think they're all going to be kind of one blancmange or one big case together. But examples of what would be an unreasonable adjustment are in the law, and they include things like, well, if I made the adjustment, it wouldn't help. So that's an unreasonable adjustment, so no point doing it. Um, the adjustment isn't practical, for example. Um, it's too expensive. And I'm just going to pause on that one. Cost is just a nightmare. Uh, it's a really thorny issue, and it's going back and forth in the UK in terms of case law. We'll have to see how our courts um, rule on this. But traditionally, the current position in the UK is you cannot just say it's too expensive to change my hotel to put a lift in it. Uh, that's disproportionate. Cost alone, the court is in law that the cost plus factor don't work. You have to have cost plus another factor to be able to um, get yourself uh, in a position where you can show that an adjustment was unreasonable. Um, also, other things in the law are your ability to secure financial and other help elsewhere. The state of Jersey has got various schemes uh, running at the moment to assist people to make uh, some reasonable adjustments. You should look into those. Disability is. It's got four components. Okay, so a person <coughs> who has got one or more long term, that's the first criteria, and by long term the law says six months or more, and I should actually say it's expected to last six months or more, um, or has lasted six months, um, or is for life, i.e., as you say in law school, until death. Um, that's what long term means. Um, secondly, rather than just physical and mental, like the UK, a bit wider, are uh, you're also disabled if you meet criteria, if you have a physical, which some very clever judge went all the way up to the Court of Appeal to explain that meant something wrong with them physically. So he deserves his pension. Uh, if you have a physical, a mental, uh, intellectual, or sensory, think of the five senses, impairment. Okay, and you could have one or more of those. That's wider than other countries and other jurisdictions have. Although, to be fair, those jurisdictions do include, say, intellectual as part of a subset of mental. And sensory, in some ways, is a subset of physical. But we've got that broad definition. And then thirdly, and this is really quite radical, and we're not talking about does it actually affect them? You know, if you're sitting here from the UK thinking, oh, I have to prove a significant long-term effect. No, no, no. In Jersey, we're just looking for hypothetically, could it affect them? That's how wide our definition is. Lots of consultation on this. Um, so if that impairment could adversely affect a person's ability to participate in any activity, any activity, not normal day-to-day -day activities like the UK, then that satisfies the third criteria uh, of what a disability is. Um, and then there's a fourth criteria. It'll be interesting to see how this plays out, because uh, we're not, uh, the politicians adopted the UN Convention definition of disability, which is the first three criteria, but we've always put our own spin on these things, and we shall have done this fourth criteria, which is in respect of an unlawful act. Um, hopefully some of you will, just to recap, will remember unlawful acts for an employer are basically the employee life cycle, recruiting, terms and conditions, dismissing any other detriment. And for those of you providing goods and services, it's um, refusing people access to your goods and services, the terms and conditions of those goods and services, and the manner in which you provide those services. Those are the unlawful acts. So what this is saying is, if you are an individual, have a long-term impairment, which could hypothetically affect your ability whether or not it does. And your employer comes along, or the good and services provider comes along and commits an unlawful act, then, and only then, are you disabled. So I hope you can see that distinction. Because what I'm, what I'm finding on the island is people are very casually, lay people, casually throwing around, um, oh, have they got a disability? Well, that's not the question. The question has to be, have they got an impairment? How long have they had it? Okay, could it affect their work? affect their ability to access my goods and services. Uh, right, how can we help? That's the conversation that needs to happen. So if you take away one thing from this morning, please try and correct your usage of the word disability. Try to think of impairments, think of these four criteria, and we're going to come to it in a minute. You need to get in between the third and the fourth if you wish to avoid liability. So um, I'll just tell you on this slide. Uh, there are some, actually, let's just do a quick straw poll. This is what I wanted to prove to you that 14% is wrong. Um, can you all put your hand up to start with, please? All of you, just stick your hand up. Um, keep it up 
If you have, and I don't wish you to disclose anything, a physical, mental, intellectual or sensory impairment. I'm keeping mine up because I can't see, I've got eyesight problems, and it's born with asthma, so I'm keeping mine up. Right, okay. Keep, keep it up, don't worry, I'll ask you to disclose it. Right, take your hand down if it's not long term. So I've had those for six months, and it works back to last longer, right? So, okay, now rest of you, no one here can take their hand out of the next bit. This is um, almost, if you like, the superfluousness of this third criteria. Whatever you've got can affect your, your ability to participate in any activity. It can do. It just has to be hypothetical. So stopping right there, looking around the room, this is the number of people who are disabled in this room. And if I was to do a quick straw poll, that roughly looks to me about 20-25%. I don't know if anyone got a different view on that. So I think it's a lot more than the 14% which is being badly drunk. Thank you. Put that down. Um, disabled unless an act has occurred. And so therefore, the second key message for you um, as business owners here is you've got to get in between, just going back a page, that third and that fourth criteria. Somebody could have an impairment and affect their ability, but if you don't base any decisions or don't uh, make any decisions at all based on that, unless you can justify it. Okay, we'll come to the defences. So if you can get in between that third and the fourth criteria, that's when you will be avoiding liability. Okay, I'm not going to dwell on this uh, uh, slide. I shall leave it for people because the bottom line is, um, as stated there, it's simpler in Jersey to prove a much wider scope uh, to show who is going to be going to be disabled as say opposed to the UK, which has this medical model, which is complicated to prove and limited scope. I'll leave you to enjoy the, uh, the bits where it's not wider and, and narrower, as uh, people have asked me that. So, excuse me, uh, Law, we're, we're very practical. Um, can you please, when you're, uh, you know, this starts in two months' time, you need to be practical. Assume anyone who is not well, or is behaving oddly, or asking for help, may be covered by the law, if you commit an unlawful act. And please don't waste time on legal questions. I mean, if you're getting sued and you come to me and we're going to trouble you, I'll be wasting time. I'll be, we're wasting time. Are we doing all the legal nuances on that side? At your stage at the coal face, don't waste time on the legal questions. Uh, concentrate on the consequences of the impairment. Does it affect that person's ability to work or to enjoy your customers or clients, to enjoy your goods and services? How long will it last? How can we help? That needs to be your mindset with this last piece of the jigsaw. <coughs> okay, so halfway there, hold on, over the hill. So that's disability. Um, how, how do, so what? So what does it mean? What's the trigger? How does discrimination happen? Well, once uh, disability is established, or those three criteria are met, then six statutory duties are triggered. Now, historically, in the last three years, only four, we've only had four, but two new ones, which I'll take you through. Um, now, I don't need you to be you know, discrimination experts on this. Don't worry if you don't get uh, all the various tests here. I'm just giving you, uh, this is just illustration to show you just how wide this is and how it plays out in practice. And all these examples are real. Um, I haven't had to make any of them up. So, um, you're used to our, our old friend, direct discrimination. Name to her manager that staff were harassing a disabled colleague. You should hopefully by now recognize that um, by making that complaint, that was stage one, she was protected. Then the employer came along and dismissed her, stage two. So she was punished for asserting this law. That's out. You should recognise that definition of hope by now. Um, harassment, as always, hasn't altered. You've got a final sixth duty not to harass people with disabilities. True example, 2010 case in the UK, where a manager asked an employee on an induction day that she had type 1 diabetes in front of the other attendees, uh, don't you check yourself here, we'll put that away. Um, during the training session, that was held to be harassment. Uh, it, and if you remember the test, unwanted conduct by the lady, violated her dignity, um, and humiliated her in front of others. Okay, just straightforward example of disability harassment. I don't know what solution would be in that one, because even if you took her to the side, away from others to ask her to do that, you might also be found to be harassing. The fact is, she can, um, inject herself if she wishes. So, um, now at this point in the presentation, I would normally say to you, okay, um, from my experience, these are the common pitfalls of this protected characteristic, but um, I'm going to correct that language. We're not, we can't think of common pitfalls, we have to be far more social model 
uh, when we do disability discrimination, we need a can-do approach. So when, as employers, when you're recruiting or promoting, same thing, just fancy recruitment promotion, um, you need to avoid discriminatory criteria in your application forms, and your job specs, and your interviews, and your selection. You need to be proactive, you need to be asking about health. We don't like, we don't like doing too British. And we've got this kind of, we're, we're hardwired, not too true. But actually, we need to ask about people's health, and we need to ask them about reasonable adjustments. So you do need to open that can of worms and deal with it. Um, you need to anticipate access requirements for recruitment. How are they going to get here? Um, can they access the questions? Can, uh, can they manage with the formats I'm dealing with? Then, this is a big one, managing con uh, performance. Well, you've had it so easy to know we have. Managing performance. Uh, or sickness or misconduct um, is, is fundamentally going to change now. You need to figure out, first of all, you need to distinguish if someone's misbehaviour or someone's absence or sickness is related to a disability, that impairment, that long term impairment. And if it is, you're going to have to maybe even discount it so that they're not going to be punished for their non poor performance or their sickness record or their misconduct. If they are, we need to be able to objectively justify it, which was proportionate. Um, and, and what's hidden in all of that is you've got to figure out as organisations how, how are you going to monitor people's health? I just told you long term, for example, is where somebody has a condition for six months. So what if the doctor letter that you got um, said, oh, Sharon's expected to be ill for four months, but I'm actually ill for six. Well, how are you going to make sure that you've stayed on top of that to know that I've now got coverage under this law? even though your doctor's letter said four months, but actually I've been ill for longer. Or conversely, something is expected to last for seven months, but actually I'm well within three months. Well, in the law, if it's expected to last more than six months, you're covered. So thereby, someone who's only got three months gets protection under this law. So you're going to have to think how you're going to monitor health. Uh, I'll come back to that on the last slide. Um, moving on, if you're dismissing people for misconduct and incapability or redundancy, you have to be aware of the need for objective justification. Make sure um, it doesn't fall foul of any uh, equal opportunity consideration on the disability front. Redundancy, for example, you can't be sticking in sick days anymore as um, a way to decide on who's had the most sick, okay, they're made redundant, when you do your selection criteria. Um, those Bradford scores, otherwise one of my client calls them his Bradford and Bingley score, <laughs> not that wrong, um, those scores can't be used, they have to be discounted where the subject is suffering from an underlying um, disability. Um, this last one, making adjustments, you need to audit. Paddy's going to talk to you about audits and you need this investigation duty, you need to be investigating any possible impairments that come across your radar from either your customers or clients of the need to prepare for this. You need to audit your current workplace profile, by which I mean also your premises, Paddy will speak to you about that. You need to audit your contractual documentation and policies. Um, this is a tough one, and I'm really glad I don't have to speak to you about data protection, but you do need to think about how this is going to interplay with your data protection responsibilities under GDPR. Um, you're going to have to monitor health, health is special category data, how are you going to get that, um, and how are you going to process that? Because if you haven't got it, you won't be able to discharge your legal obligation to handle and manage um, conduct and performance issues. Um, you need to address any discriminatory practices you know exist. Um, train your staff, cover disability as well as the other six uh, protected characteristics. Preempt that unhelpful banter. You can still joke around as always, but it can't be on those seven grounds. Um, so disability jokes uh, are out, or anti-disability jokes. Support victims, uh, warn or sack your uh, perpetrators, reprogram them. Collate statistics, not obligatory, if you're from the UK, we, we don't have Martin's problem of having to collate and show what, what you have done with this number of disabled people versus non-disabled people, but it might help you um, if you and I are in court together trying to show what you've done in the past. Uh, put insurances in place, um, you know, it's obviously just a conservative approach, um, but above all, take informed advice. If you're not sure, you're not expected to be experts in this, it is quite complicated, do take informed advice.